Uh -huh. Something incorrect happening without intention. Uh, do you think uh, just without intention or one of the parties in the contract can induce somebody to make a mistake? Yes, yes, so exactly, can induce, yeah, uh, so mistake is a, is a, it's a difficult area of contract law because uh, nowadays the English law uh, does not recognize a, a, a theory of mistake. Uh, also, like there are so many cases that are resolved in different ways uh, that is difficult to reconcile with each other. And, uh, and in England, the number of mistake cases uh, is very, very small. So this is kind of like a difficult area, uh, but we, we, we are going to, to start discovering it together. Okay, so let's go. What are we going to, what are we going to see in this lecture? Uh, we are going to see that mistakes can be unilateral or bilateral, uh, also uh, mistakes at common law, mistakes in equity, uh, that at common law uh, an operative mistake will render the contract void, uh, and in equity uh, the effect of the mistake is said to render the contract voidable. And also we are going to talk a little about a mistake of law, mistake of fact. Okay, uh, what do you think by unilateral mistake? What does unilateral mistake mean? Exactly, perfect. Only one partner to the contract made a mistake. Mm -hmm. That is excellent. And a bilateral mistake, what is for you a bilateral mistake? Okay, both parties make the same mistake. That is true, but we are going to see uh, that bilateral mistake, there are two types of bilateral mistakes that uh, the parties share the same mistake or each party is mistaken but they don't share the same mistake. So we are going to see uh, later in the class like these two types of mistakes. Uh, about bilateral mistake, uh, like you have said already that it's a mistake of both parties, uh, in general uh, the law will only provide relief where the mistake is a bilateral mistake. Uh, basically, it's in those cases, but there are some exceptions to this point that we are going, uh, be, we are going also discuss uh, later on, okay? Uh, a bilateral mistake, I need to, to tell you, that can be common. Uh, what do you understand by a common bilateral mistake. What do you think is a common bilateral mistake? The parties make the same mistake as each other. Yeah, that's good, Jennifer. Uh huh. Regular mistakes from both parties in an agreement. Uh, I will go with Jennifer. Uh, that me, uh, a, a common bilateral mistake means that the parties make the same mistake as each other. They share the same mistake. Um, so we are going to see in the next uh, slide uh, about these types of bilateral mistakes. Um, now, uh, talking about the other, uh, the other points that are, that are mentioned in this slide, uh, what do you understand by mistaken equity? What do you think is mistaken equity?
Okay. Mistake in equity is doubted now in English law. Uh, a party or parties are mistaken as to the law of equity. Yes. Yes. That's, that's, a, that's a good answer. Uh, nowadays, as I mentioned, a mistake in equity is doubted in English law. And uh, what do you think is a mistake at common law? And what does it bring? A party or parties are mistaken as to someone. As to the common law, yes, that's correct. Uh, when the mistake, when a mistake at common law happens, uh, we can say that an operative mistake will render the contract void. Uh, a mistake is operative. This happens when, because of the mistake, no contract has been created. So, uh, and in these cases, the courts are reluctant to find an operative mistake. Uh, a reason for this is uh, like the court, they don't want to affect the rights of innocent third parties. Uh, and also like if the contract is considered void, uh, the, the, the courts are reluctant to, uh, to find this because this uh, will mean that they have to rewrite the contract between the parties when that is not the idea of contract law. And as you have seen before in classes uh, before, uh, the idea of contract law is like the, uh, the agreement of the minds of two parties meet together. So uh, that's what courts want to, uh, want to keep. They don't want to they don't want to substitute the agreements that the parties have passed uh, when they make the contract. Okay? Uh, in equity, uh, the effect of a mistake is said to render the contract voidable, not void, which is different uh, from voidable. In equity, it is the court who can uh, render the contract voidable and not the parties. So it is in the hands of the court to decide in the court of equity to decide whether or not a contract is voidable. Okay? A mistake of law and mistake of fact. A what do you understand by mistake of law? What do you think it is? Exactly. In, uh -huh. in a status, case law, other law, mistaken as to what the law specifies. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, mistake of law, uh, in English contract law, the English contract law has long bar relief uh, where the mistake was one of law uh, rather than of, than of fact. Um, it's, there, there was no mistake of law sufficient to render the contract void. So this is a, like a, a we can say kind of hard to uh, to prove in court when someone makes a mistake, which is by law in a statute. Good, now yes. Thank you very much. Uh, a mistake of fact. What do you think is a mistake of fact? Exactly. And what? quality this mistake uh, needs to have a factor mistake, yeah. So how this mistake of fact needs to be? Fact. From the objective perspective, yes. Yeah. This uh, mistaken fact needs to be material or very important to the agreement. 
Okay, Le, uh, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say, uh, I don't know, somebody can tell me who is your uh, favorite author? Who do you like to read? So we can start the example from, from that point. Okay, Jane Austen. Okay, uh, let's assume that I am a bookseller. Okay, Austin Macmillan Perth. Let's assume that I'm a, a, a bookseller and a, I have agreed to sell a copy of a, of a novel of Macmillan that was signed by, by this author, okay? And assume that a, Afnan is the buyer, okay? So Afnan is only interested in buying the book of Macmillan because it contains this author's signature. I know that I'm the, the bookseller, know this, and I know uh, that, you know, like, because of the authentic signature, the book has a very high price. However, let's say, it is later discovered that the signature was actually forged years, years ago. And I didn't know, nor did Afnan, okay? So what, what is this, this mistake that we made? This would be a material fact, yes. This would be a mistake of fact material to the deal because it is important for Afnan that the book has the signature of Macmillan, right? So, and also it is important for me, to me, as a bookseller, because I'm going to get a higher price. So, in this case, what rights Adnan have? Who is the buyer? What Afnan can do, you know? Okay, sue the seller, yeah. Besides that, you know, remember that it has been that I'm, that I am the seller and I also was mistaken. You know, like I didn't induce Afnan, I didn't lie to him, okay, precision of the contract, mm -hmm. the contract is voidable, remember, that voidable is at an option of the court. It's not an option of the parties, okay? So he can enter the contract void, yes. This would be, in this case, the mistake uh, regarding the book, the signature in the book was a mistake of fact material to the deal and as none, would have the right to return the book and get the money back. She. And, okay. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, and she can get the money back. Okay. So this example, what illustrates, is a mutual mistake. As Nan and I have made a mistake, with which is a mistake of a material fact. Okay. And and like you said before, the party, in this case, Afnan, who was adversely affected by the mistake, has the right to cancel the contract or rescind the contract. Okay? Uh, do you, did you, did you get the, the, the idea of mistake of fact? That it has to be very, very important to the agreement. Okay? So, uh, let's go to the next to the next slide, so we can start with bilateral mistakes. Okay, uh, as you told me before, bilateral mistakes is a mistake uh, made by both parties. Correct. 
So we need to mention here that there are two basic, two basic types of bilateral mistakes, okay? Uh, one is each of the parties is mistaken, but they don't share the mistake. And the other type is the parties share their mistake, okay? So uh, within bilateral mistakes, we are going to find different situations. Uh, the first one is absence of genuine agreement. Agreement, absence of genuine agreement. So, what do you think is an absence of agreement? What, what would be the result if the, if the agreement doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. No valid contract. There will be no contract. Yes. None was reached. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. In absence of agreement, uh, the parties are each mistaken, but they don't share a mistake. Uh, the mistake of each party needs to be fundamental. So no contract can be created, okay? Uh, that, that, that is very important, that the mistake of each party needs to be fundamental, that no contract can be created. Uh, we can say that in, in these cases, uh, the offer and acceptance, they don't correspond, they don't meet. So they are in cross purposes. Um, this happens because on an objective interpretation, uh, it cannot be said what the parties have intended. So if you cannot say what the parties have intended, a contract has not been created. I mentioned here in the slide uh, this case, Raffles versus Wishel House. And in this case, uh, can somebody tell me what are the facts in this case, like very briefly? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to let you know the facts very briefly, okay, uh, to illustrate when that absence of agreement happens. In this case, in Ruffles, uh, one party bought and the other sold cotton to be shipped on the vessel Peerless from Bombay. But unknown to either party, there were two ships Peerless and each intended different ships. So the core here found that there was no contract. We can say that here, you know, like the offer and acceptance didn't meet. So that's why the court found that there was no contract, okay? Now let's talk about a, another situation of bilateral mistake, a, which is common mistake. A, and the case that illustrates this is the case Bell versus Lever Bro. Uh, what you can tell me, what do you understand by common mistake? Hello? Can you hear me?
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Writing uh, in the chat box. Okay, so can somebody tell me, you know, what you understand by, by common mistake? Okay, so I'm going to let you know what is common mistake, okay? Uh, common mistake occurs uh, where both parties to a contract are mistaken about a critical element of the agreement. So they share that mistake, okay? Um, usually, common mistake deals uh, with those situations where an apparent contract lacks consent. Thus, the contract is void from the beginning. Um, why do you think that when you know when this contract lacks lacks consent, so the contract is void from the from the beginning? Why do you think is that? Why do you think that happens? Can you tell me on what depends? This is based on the on the theory of contract that it is like if a contract exceeds, it is due to the agreement of the parties. Excuse me, Ms. Melissa, can I speak for a second? Excuse me? Um, I just got a message from Ms. Ujala. She wants me to just inform you that uh, we are all responding in the chat box. When you ask a question, we write oh. it over there. Oh, I'm I sorry. Yeah, no, I didn't click the arrow. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> not, not a problem. I okay, just thank you. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Yeah, we are answering all your questions. It's just yes. that Writing. Okay. Thank you. All right, no problem. Thanks. There's one not clear and B was okay. Okay. So um as I was mentioned then like uh, when a contract lacks consent consent, it is said that the contract is void from the beginning. And this is uh, based uh, on the theory of contract that is that a contract exists because of the agreement of the parties. Um, in this case, in Bell, uh, can somebody tell me briefly what are the facts in this case? What's happening in this case? Okay, let me, this is probably the only case I know. Uh, in this case, uh, Bell and uh, another man were appointed as directors of companies. Mm -hmm. And for a certain period, the owners of the company wanted to terminate their contract. So they gave them a termination package of a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But they weren't entitled to get 
the money because their contract had stated that they should not use their position to make any profit for themselves, which they had. And if they do use that position to make profit, then the owners can terminate without giving them any money. Mm -hmm. After they paid over the money, the owners realized that they had used their position, and so they wanted them to give them back the money, but the court said that uh, not both parties were not aware of this when they made the contract, so it was not a critical. It was not critical to the contract, so the contract was upheld. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, here in this case, thank you so much. Uh, in this case, uh, the court uh, indicates that a common mistake. Uh, needs to be at the, cent at the center of the contract because if, if it is not at the center of the contract, then the contract is not void. In this case, the, the House of Lords, uh, they, uh, they said that the contract was not void and the money that Bell received, he can, he can keep it. So this is a, an example of a of a case that illustrates common mistake. Um, we, are, we are going to, to see a little more uh, of common mistake when we talk about a mistake as to the quality of the subject matter. Uh, the next uh, category within a bilateral mistake is a non-existence of the subject matter. Okay, uh, here um, what happened is that the parties, they reach an agreement to deal with a subject matter which unknown to either party doesn't exist. Um, this is what is called res extinta, which means like the thing is extinguished. Uh, so the contract suffers from initial impossibility from the beginning, so it cannot be performed, okay? Um, let, let's, let's, let's put an example. Uh, for instance, uh, A, the seller, contracts to sell his cow to B, the buyer, but without the knowledge of each party, at the time of the contract is entered, the cow is dead. So what happens here? What happened with Ace Beauty? Exactly, there will be no contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but because the subject matter doesn't exist, but it is impossible for A to sell the cow. Exactly, thank you, Bash. Uh, it is impossible for A to sell the cow. Um, also, a case that illustrates this is Couturier versus Hasty. In this case, uh, the seller sold a cargo of corn to the buyer. But neither party was aware that at the moment of the contract, the captain of the ship carrying the corn has already sold it. So in that case, it is impossible for the seller to sell the corn to the buyer because the, the corn didn't exist at the moment the contract was, was formed. So what we can say here is um, when the subject matter of the contract does, doesn't exist at the time of the contract, courts will find that the contract is void, okay? But let's be careful that this will not occur where the mistake is brought about by the negligence of one party, okay? So this one means that the parties, they didn't know that the subject matter didn't exist 
at the at the at the time of the at the time of the comp. A mistake as to owner ownership. Here the the case it is Cooper versus Phipps. Um, what do you think that is mistake as to ownership? Someone says something that he, she does own or does, doesn't own. Okay. But this, uh, these cases of mistake as to ownership involve uh, a situation of initial impossibility. Why? Because here, one party agrees to sell and the other party agrees to buy something which unknown to either of them is already owned by the buyer. So the agreement is impossible to perform. Why? Because it is impossible to transfer the ownership since the buyer already owns the thing. The mistake must be fundamental to the agreement. Okay? Uh, in this, in the case of Cooper versus Phipps, uh, an uncle told his nephew, not intending to misrepresent anything, but the uncle was in fact in error, that he, the uncle, was entitled to a fisher. So the nephew, after the uncle's death, believing what the uncle had told him, entered into, into an agreement to rent the fishery from the uncle's daughters. However, the fishery belonged to the nephew himself. So here there is, a, is a case of mistake as to ownership. The nephew didn't know that he already owned the fishery, okay? In this case, uh, the court held that the mistake was only such as, as to make the contract voidable, which means that the nephew had the option uh, to cancel the to cancel the the contract. Okay. Do you have any questions so far? Okay, so let, let, let's continue. Uh, there are three more uh, situations within bilateral mistakes. These are a mistake as, the as to the possibility of performance, mistake as to a quality of the subject matter, and fundamental mistake going to the root of the concept. Okay, mistake as to the possibility of performance. Uh, there are some circumstances where the partners, where the parties may be mistaken as to the possibility of performance, uh, which means the parties have a shared misapprehension that performance of their agreement is possible when in fact it is not. So the contract is void because it cannot be performed. Uh, it is necessary uh, to note that the apparent contract is only void where the mistake is of both parties. It has to be both parties that have the mistake, okay? Uh, what happens if one of the parties has assumed uh, the risk of performance? What would happen? If we can see from the agreement that one party has assumed the risk of performance, 
this, this will be a case of mistake as to the possibility of performance. Okay, it is a mistake. The risk should have been communicated to the other party. Okay, let's say like the, 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 from the agreement, from the agreement, we can say that one party has assumed the risk. Would it be a mistake? Do you think it would be a still a mistake? No. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Penny. Yes. If one party has assumed the risk, that party will probably be in breach of contract. The party will be held responsible. Thank you, Bash. Yeah. So uh, this a concept of impossibility is going to be discussed in in later lectures. So I don't I don't want to 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 tell you too much about it now because uh, you, you are going to 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 have the lecture of this uh, in more depth. Okay. Um, now mistake as to a quality of the subject matter. This uh, subject creates great difficulties nowadays uh, because very few contracts are found to be void on the ground that there is a sufficiently fundamental mistake as to quality. Uh, the, this sufficiently fundamental uh, condition that the court has put is, is very, very hard to prove. Um, also, like, uh, it is difficult to distinguish this uh, sufficiently fundamental quality from the assumption of a risk. Uh, which work to the disadvantage of, of one or both parties. Um, we are going to see uh, in the next slide that uh, it is because of these difficulties that courts uh, have created an equitable device uh, to circumvent the difficulties posed by mistake of law. So uh, what do you understand by mistake as to a quality of the subject matter? Mm -hmm. When a car model is mistaken, yeah, that that's that's a good example. Some buying a car thinking it is in a good condition, but it's not exactly. Yeah, uh, you 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 are right. Like you know, like let's say like uh, like I agree with you uh, to buy from you a car. Um, I don't know too much about cars, but uh, let's see, like, uh, I don't know, like, that is like a very fancy, expensive model, right? Like, um, yes, a Ferrari, yeah. Um, let's say, like, I, I agree with you to buy uh, from you a Ferrari car, correct? Uh, but maybe, I don't know, like, I have, I, I know I have heard about Ferrari, but I don't know, like, it is, you know, like, this very super expensive car, and here that there is a, a, a but you have in mind that, okay, this is a Ferrari car, a very expensive, so here there is a mistake as to the quality of the subject matter. Uh, maybe I will think, like, okay, Ferrari is not so, not so, it's expensive, it's expensive one, but not so, Oh wow, you know this kind of part. But uh, let me see quality, which renders the subject matter the company to what what is believed to be. That that is a good definition. Thank you, Abby. 
quality which renders the subject matter of the contract essentially different to that what it was believed to be. Yeah, that 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 is uh, that is excellent. Thank you so much. Um, now let's uh, let's see what do you understand by fundamental mistake going to the root of the contract. Here, the parties, do they need to be mistaken? Do, does each party need to be mistaken and they don't have, they don't need to share a common mistake? Exactly, to the core of the contract. Mm -hmm. In this case, the parties, critical mistake, yes, in this case, the parties share a common mistake, which is so, so fundamental that it goes to the very root of the contract. Mistake as to something the contract is based on. Uh, so the, the mistake, the share mistake is so fundamental that it goes to the, to the root of the contract, to the very consideration we can say. Uh, so what happened is that the contract is void, okay? So now we have finished with bilateral mistakes and let's start, let's start with unilateral mistakes. Okay, uh, uh, an example, an example of a, uh, of this last category of bilateral mistake, we can say for instance, like um, you and I agree, uh, I agree with you to buy, let's say, uh, to buy gold per gram for a, I don't know, let's say gram like forty dollars the gram, a, but there is a, like a kind of like a miscommunication. Like you, you and I always like, let's say, like you and I. A, always buy and sell gold, let's say like uh, $40 the gram, okay? And it's always like that deal that we have. But uh, one day I, you told me, you make a mistake and said, okay, I'm going to, to, to buy, a, to, to sell you a gold and the gram is going to be, you made a mistake of $4 per gram, okay? And if that happened, I said, Okay, I know you are mistaken, you know, so in this case, the mistake will go to the root of the contract. The price is, is a term of agreement, so the mistake will go to the root of the contract, okay? Okay, as we mentioned before, a unilateral mistake is a mistake of one party only as you, you told me, okay? Uh, courts uh, are generally, uh, don't like to find that a contract is void at law where the mistake is the mistake of one party only. Uh, because by doing so, in most instances, the non-mistaken party will be affected. Uh, so, here in unilateral mistakes, you, in order to find the contract void, uh, you need uh, to, to find one of these two situations, okay? The first situation is uh, the non-mistaken party is aware of the other party's mistake, but proceeds to contract away anyway, okay? And in the second case, 
the non-mistaken party has created a mistake to induce the non-mistaken party to come. So it's in those two situations that the contract will find the contract, uh, that the courts will find the contract void, just in those two situations, okay? Um, and in both cases, the non-mistaken party doesn't have any reasonable expectation to protect, okay? So let's see the situations of unilateral mistakes. There are three situations in unilateral mistakes. Mistaken assumptions or promises, mistakes as to identity, and documents signed under a misapprehension as to their content. Okay, let's uh, discuss the, the first one. Uh, mistaken assumptions or promises. Um, here, the mistake is said to, to negative the consent of the mistaken party that no contract arises, okay? Uh, but a condition is like the non-mistaken party must be aware of the other party's mistake, okay? So there, there, must, there must be a, a knowledge by the non-mistaken party. Uh, in this case, Smith versus Hex, the claimant uh, sold the defendant oaths after showing him a sample of the oaths. Uh, but the defendant mistakenly thought he was buying all oaths. Uh, but in fact, they were new oaths. The claimant didn't do anything to induce a mistake and was unaware of this, okay? Uh, so here, what, what would be the, the, the conditions needed for the contract to be void? In this case, let, let, let remember that in this case, the claimant, he didn't induce the mistake and he was not aware of that, of this mistake. So, what would it needed for the contract to be void? Uh huh. Good. If he knew the claimant wanted all oats, uh huh. Yes. So the contract would have been void only if two factors were present. You know, like if the defendant had been mistaken as to the promise made to him by the claimant, like Bash says, you know, like if, you know, there was there like the defendant, the claimant told, okay, I'm going to give you a, all oaths, but at the end he gave him new oaths, which was not the case, but that is one, one factor that uh, it is needed. And the other one is like the defendant knew about the claimant's mistake as to the nature of the promise made to him by the defendant, okay? Uh, in these situations, it is important that uh, as long as one party doesn't misrepresent or defraud the other party, courts will generally find agreement within the parties which is necessary to form a contract, okay? So, uh, as we mentioned before, um, uh, when there is a, a unilateral mistake, courts are very reluctant to find a, a contract void, okay? Another example uh, could be like, let's say that um, A always sells a B grain at a price of X per pound, okay? So one day A offers to sell B grain at X price per ton. B realizing that A has made a mistake, 
snaps at ACE offer and accepts immediately. So here the mistake is operative. The mistake negative ACE consent in such a way that there is no contract. Also know that B was aware of ACE mistake and B's conduct is such a that is unconscionable for him to hold A to a contract. Okay? Uh, let's talk about now about mistake as to identity. And uh, within this category, we can uh, see that there is like face to face contracts and contracts formed at a distance. Okay? Uh, what do you understand by face to face contracts? In front of each other, correct. Mm -hmm. It is when uh, the contract is formed between parties who appear before each other. Here, a presumption arises that the mistaken party intends to contract with the person before him. The result is a contract which is voidable at the option of the mistaken party. Okay? And um, what do you understand by contracts form at a distance? Through emails, mail, phone, other means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here, uh, by in the staff online. Mm -hmm. Here in these cases, uh, when a mistake occurs in this type of contract formed at a distance, it is likely that the apparent contract is void for mistake. But uh, for this to occur, the identity of the party must be critical in the formation of the contract. Uh, we have here a case. Uh, it is Condi versus Lindsay. Uh, in this case, the Rondor presented himself in such a way as to appear as a legitimate firm. The innocent party thought that they were dealing with a legitimate firm and shipped the goods to the Rondor. The court found that the contract was bold because there was a lack of consent. So, we can establish here that in these cases of contracts formed at a distance, uh, that if A thinks he has agreed with C because he believes B, with whom, who, with whom he is negotiating, is C, and B is aware of, is aware that A didn't intend to make any agreement with him, and A has established the, that the identity of C was a matter of crucial importance, then the contract will be bought. So these are the, the requirements in this type of uh, contract for a distance in order to find a mistake as to identity. The identity must be very, very uh, important uh, to the agreement. Okay, another uh, another example uh, or another case that illustrates this is um, the case of Shogun Finance uh, versus Hudson. Uh, here, uh, Rondor entered into a written contract to purchase from Shogun Finance a vehicle in credit. Uh, the Rondor fraudulently assumed the identity of another person. The court found that the identity was critical to Shogun because it was necessary to check the credit rating of their potential borrowers. So the apparent contract was a void due to the mistake of identity and an absence of consensus. Um, so this is a contract form at a distance. Now, documents uh, signed 
and there are misapprehension as to their context. Here, uh, we, when we sign documents, we you suppose that we have to read very carefully and we take full responsibility for our signature. Um, but uh, there are some exceptions. Uh, when a person may have been uh, so, seri so seriously misled that the document is held to be void under the defense uh, non est factum, which means it is not his deed. Um, this defense is available to a person who signed the documents with a fundamental misapprehension as to the substance of the document, uh, provided a condition is that the person who signed the document took all due care. Okay, uh, so these are the three uh, categories within un unilateral mistakes. Uh, let's talk about our last topic here in mistake, that is mistake in equity. Okay, um, mistake in equity is doubted in English law at present. Uh, and there are three forms of equitable relief, uh, ratification, a specific performance, and rescission. Uh, what do you understand by ratification? Rectify the terms. Mm -hmm. Correcting a problem, correcting, okay. But this 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 uh, this correcting the mistake occurs in the making of the agreement or in the recording of the agreement. In the recording, yes. So this remedy uh, is concerned with correcting a mistake which occurs in the recording of the agreement, not in the making of the agreement. Um, the, the possibility of this relief exists when a written contract fails to express the common intention of the parties. Uh, even a unilateral mistake may be sufficient basis for rectification when it is known to the other party and that part and that party fails to draw the mistake, to draw the mistaken party's attention to it. Okay? So this this can be used in a unilateral mistake as well. Um, let's say for example that A and B negotiates the price of their contract in American dollars, agree on a price uh, in American dollars, but they wrongly provide the price in Canadian dollars in the written contract. So the written contract can be rectified to accord with the actual agreement of the parties. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about now about a specific performance. Uh, a specific performance is uh, in general terms, is made when uh, damages are an inadequate remedy. Okay, uh, this uh, topic about specific performance is going to be discussed uh, in the following classes, but I, I, I wanted to give you like a, a basic concept. Uh, a specific performance happens when damages are an inadequate remedy for, for one party. Okay, uh, it is discretionary, uh, that is, uh, it is flexible and responsive to the justice of individual case. So, uh, it, it means that it, the court is not obliged to, to give, a, to order a specific performance uh, always. No, it depends on the case. Um, so, this, this, this topic will be discussed. Uh, on the following classes. And uh, rescission. Rescission, um, uh, equity could intervene to rescind the contract. Rescission means that the contract is voidable by the court and not by one of the parties. Okay? Um, nowadays in English uh, law, the ability of the court of equity to rescind an agreement as a result of a common mistake is in doubt. So, uh, in general terms, rescission uh, means that the contract is voidable by the court and not by one of the parties. 
I'm sorry, my daughter. Uh, so that is uh, all for today for this class. Uh, you know, if do you have any questions? So, thank you so much for your class, uh, for your attention. Uh, it has been a pleasure for me uh, to give you this class. And, uh, you know, like, uh, and uh, 